Hey everybody, before I get started, I just wanted to mention a couple of ways that you can engage with me on a more personal level. I have a few avenues set up and I keep focusing on one and I figured, why don't I make a short little video talking about all of them real quick before we get into these uh, episodes. So first thing, Patreon. There's a link in the episode description and every episode description to the Patreon, as well as uh, a video on the feed called Major Announcement that has all the details of what each tier offers and how much they cost. I implore you to check that out. I offer a lot of cool shit for my patrons. Uh, second thing, the Discord channel. There's also a Discord link in the episode description and in every episode description. I have multiple channels set up there for each show that I'm covering, and it's a great way to just engage with me. I have a channel set up for... Uh, uh, MMA talk as well. I'm a big MMA fan. So if you're an MMA fan, you can check that out as well. There's a link to the discord in the episode description. And then lastly, oh, the Facebook and Twitter, social media, follow me on there. I post news on there. When I say news, I mean like, hey, I'm stopping covering this show. Hey, I'm starting covering this show. Let me know what you think about this. I do uh, live watches of things on Facebook where like I'll check in and say, I'm watching so-and-so show. And then I'll like live comment while I'm watching it. And that'll be cool if maybe you watch that show too and you want to watch along with me or you're watching it later and you want to see my thoughts, which are usually pretty entertaining because I'm usually pretty high when I'm writing them. So uh, check out all those links in each episode description and let's talk about this episode. Peace. One mic, one mic. Yeah. All I need is one mic. One mic. Yeah. All I need is one mic. One mic. One mic. Hey everybody, welcome back to One Mic, and today I'm here to talk about Season 3, Episode 9, the penultimate episode of Season 3 of Hulu's Only Murders in the Building, entitled 30. Now, this episode title is based on the fact that the events of this episode take place on Mabel's 30th birthday, and the B-plot of this episode, which doesn't get a ton of time, seems to focus on uh, Mabel's hang-ups over not having achieved by 30 what she's expected, what she expected of herself to have achieved by that point. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later toward the end of the video. But whenever I hear something like that that feels like it might be true or based in real life, I kind of look it up. Now, obviously, I don't think that Selena Gomez herself is dissatisfied with her accomplishments to date. I think she's probably pretty proud of what she's accomplished so far. And if she made one of those, what she call it, a mashup or something, if she made one of those things when she was a child, I guarantee whatever she put was less than where she got right now. But um, when she said that, I thought, what if today's date is actually Selena Gomez's birthday? Because I feel like so that feels like something that could be the case. It wasn't uh, <laughs> close. Selena Gomez did recently turn 30, but it was in July of last year. Anyway. Uh, I really love this episode, man. You know, I, I haven't been too kind uh, toward the mystery aspect of the show due to how predictable and formulaic I've been saying it's been. And to that point, even one of the big reveals of this episode was super obvious and predicted by me in my video for episode three. So if you don't believe me when I say that I saw something coming, it's documented uh, for eternity on the internet. So, uh, uh, but this week, I enjoyed the mystery being the focus of the episode and just having the Omid B crew back together again to work on it. That was great to just be around. You know, week to week, we've kind of focused on one character or one aspect of the mystery, which, as I've been saying, has predictably been more of a who are they going to point the finger at this week and how are they going to absolve that person at the very beginning of the next episode. And like that routine got kind of played out for me. But this week, the crew took more of a like overall look at the mystery. And, you know, they started by like recapping what we know so far for the audience. I thought that was kind of, that was, that was cute. Like, you know, they, they were like all around their little board or whatever. And they're like, oh, and then this clue happened. I'm like, yeah, thank you for the previously on. But, uh, um, but then they advanced each piece of evidence that uh, felt important when it, when it was presented. So what I mean by, what I mean by that kind of weird jumble of words there is that I feel like the show presents evidence constantly, right? Uh, but like I said, like I've said on my videos all season, I feel like the vast majority are red herrings. And the, like, usually the things that they end an episode with is like a red herring to be like, oh, it must have been so and so. And then it's not. But every now and then there's a clue that you could tell is one that's meant to stick. Like it'll come up over and over again. Or it's something that's not tied to a person, but it's a very interesting fact. Uh, you know, those are the things that when I say uh, they advance the bits of evidence that felt important. Those are the ones that I'm talking about. Those ones that uh, are obviously... I'm not going to say they're obviously not red herrings, but they're ones that they don't feel like red herrings. It feels like, okay, this this feels like it matters. That kind of stuff, they advance in this episode. For example, 
you know, watching this season, there were several things, like I said, that felt like clues and not like red herrings. Uh, the paper that got shredded. That didn't feel like a red herring because it didn't point It didn't point to anybody specifically. We couldn't say, oh, so-and-so shredded the paper. Therefore, we don't know who shredded the paper, but we know paper was shredded. So like that felt like less a red herring and more like something that's going to matter later. Uh, Ben's conversation with that mystery person, again, who is this person is the mystery, not pointing a finger at whoever it was that he was talking to. So that felt important. Like, okay, well, who is this person that Ben is talking to? Which obviously I figured out in video three. Uh, uh, another example, the, the, the fucking pig comment uh, on, the, on the mirror. Like those things consistently came up throughout the season and all of those things were pretty much resolved in this episode. You know, Howard, Howard gets the paper put together using Mabel's great piece of advice from last week about matching the fonts. Uh, Oliver looks at the page and realizes it's from Maxine's unpublished review that was panning his show. And as he reads the paper, uh, panning Ben and Ben's performance in particular. Then the big reveal involves the uh, mystery person and the fucking pig comment. As we learned that Ben wasn't talking to a person, he was talking to a cookie and he wrote the fucking pig comment on the mirror himself to deride himself for eating the cookie. Obviously, I think that that twist was predictable as I literally fucking predicted it. However, I didn't predict how important it would be in pointing us in the direction of the killer, nor did I predict it would be tied to the fucking pig comment. So, well, in retrospect, I, sh I should have <laughs> put two and two together. Uh, but, you know, I also didn't expect it to be so pivotal in finding the killer either. But as soon as, as, soon as I saw Cliff... Uh, attempting to give the bag of cookies to Ben, I immediately put in my notes, this proves my Ben was talking to food theory and Cliff probably poisoned the cookies. That's like that's what I put in my notes in that moment. As soon as I saw Cliff, when, when it was something like, uh, Donna was the last person to see Cliff. And, she, and, and I mean, what Donna was the last person to see Ben or whatever, and we see Cliff at the scene. Immediately, that was my thought. Now, uh, even though the episode very clearly tells us it was Donna... Uh, there's still one more episode and still time left for one more twist. Uh, I don't think they'll go somewhere cr terribly crazy, but I still think it's on the table that Cliff or maybe someone else altogether, but for the same reason of protecting the show and or protecting Cliff, uh, actually committed the crime. Uh, I also like how this episode changed the perception of Ben, I think, a little bit. Uh, the whole season he's been presented as an asshole, and he, and he is. Uh, I think the scene with him and Dickie where he... Uh, took Dickie's notes about quitting and said, no, now I'm no bro. You know, that, that was a shitty, that was Ben being shitty. But like most people, Ben's a three-dimensional guy. And I thought it was really nice of uh, him to be making those handkerchiefs himself, you know, with his little sewing circle friends and how he's, he was excited to give them to the cast. And it wasn't until he got there and people started fucking with him that he went from feeling great to sounding frantic on the phone. Uh, so, you know, I, I like adding that little, uh, that added layer of complexity to how we look at the Ben character. Um, now, while I said I did really like this episode, and I did, there is one thing I didn't like. It's not a huge thing, but it was huge enough for me to mention on this, uh, on this video. I didn't like them glazing over Oliver's second heart attack like that. Uh, so I commended them last week for building up a high stakes moment. You know, the first heart attack didn't mean shit because I'm like, what well, ain't going to fucking kill Oliver. So <laughs> like there's no drama here, but they set up stakes for the second one by saying something to the effect of like, oh, you were lucky this time, but next time you may not be lucky. You know, whatever, whatever it is that they say, it doesn't matter. But that's the whole point of that is to so that you understand if it happens again, it's serious because they know that we didn't take it seriously the first time either. So I, I picked up what they were putting down. I'm like, okay, like in my head, I logged, like he's probably gonna have another one and it's probably gonna be serious. So when it did happen, I'm like, oh shit, this is a big fucking deal. How's this gonna affect Oliver? Uh, how's it gonna affect the team? The team? How's it gonna affect the show? And then we open this episode, they're like, well, it's been five days and Oliver's okay to go home now. He had a stint. And Oliver shows no ill effects the whole rest of the episode. And I'm like, that to me, I think that was really fucking weak because it was an exploitation of the severity of heart attacks to get a cheap, like, emotional moment out of us at the very end of an episode that you saw no, you had no intention of actually, like, seeing through and actually doing something with. They just were like, how can we fuck with them to get in the episode like usual? 
and then they like they took something serious like the heart attack what they built up to is something serious and they didn't treat it as something serious after it happened so that made me feel fucked with and i, I don't like i don't like to feel fucked with like i, I don't know they, I, like give the shit some more fucking time don't just be like yeah it's been five days and he's free to go now Ta-da! like toodaloo or whatever the fuck like no like I don't know, man. Give me like a even like a fucking montage with some like dissolves and <laughs> show time passing of them sitting by his bed being worried something. Don't just be like, yeah, it's been five days and he's okay now. Like I thought, okay, clearly I was more mad about that. <laughs> mad about that than I let on, but that's fucking shitty, man. They fucking played us, man. I don't fuck, well, fuck a, it's a fucking dry hand fucking hand job, man. Fuck out of here. <laughs> um yeah, uh, uh, oh god. Anyway, uh, the episode's B plot uh, uh, and episode title surround Mabel's thirtieth birthday and how she's not living the life she expected to be living at thirty. I said I was going to talk about this again. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but for starters, none of us are living or are or were living the lives that we were expecting. Boo, not at thirty. Uh, very few people are doing what they expected to be doing at thirty, especially based on what they were hoping for at six or whatever. I do wonder though. If this is a setup of, you know, uh, you know, I was supposed to be married to Josh Hartnett and have kids by now, and it's going to lead into us, and it's going to lead into Mabel being pregnant. Uh, and I, I, didn't somebody ask her that earlier in the season? Like, are you pregnant? And she was like, no, no, no. That happened, right? Yeah. So, like, I'm not thinking of another. I feel, I feel like somebody asked her that earlier in the season. Was it Donna? I don't know, but... I don't know. I feel like that might be a setup for that. So uh, again, another prediction: if 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 we end in in the season finding out that that Mabel is pregnant, remember remember what I said. So uh, anyway, that's all I got this week. Like I said, I really enjoyed this one. I'm looking forward to the finale next week. And until then, peace. <laughs>